My name is Jim Luby. I'm a professor in the Department of Horticultural Science at the University of Minnesota, where I direct a program in breeding and genetics of fruit crops. My first job as an undergraduate was working for an oats breeder, and that's really where I developed my interest in plant breeding. I certainly liked biology before that and, and genetics, but that's where I got my first exposure to plant breeding and really thought this would be a kind of cool career to have. Probably the most well-known variety that's come from the University of Minnesota fruit breeding program would be the Honeycrisp apple. Honeycrisp was about 30 years in the making. It was introduced in 1991. Uh, the breeding started actually well before I got there even. That apple's become very popular in many parts of the United States and is starting to be grown in other parts of the world. We're looking for the appearance of the apple, uh, its texture in terms of its firmness and crispness and juiciness, and then its, its flavor in terms of its sweetness and tartness and then other interesting flavors that it might have. These crops, like most fruit crops, are asexually propagated or clonally propagated. And that means once we do the hybridization and make the cross between the mother and the father, get the seed, grow that little seedling up, that's the end as far as going through seed for propagation. And in the case of apples, to clone new plants, we would use some form of grafting. It's amazing, you know, out of two parents, just the tremendous range of types you can get. Sizes, colors, some that are so hard they hurt your teeth, some that are nice and sweet, and some that are just real pucker-uppers. <laughs> the consumer has a very high recognition of the names of the varieties. They're almost brands. So for example, a consumer might know the, the Honeycrisp apple and might go to the store specifically to get it, whereas they don't know what variety of strawberry they're getting. What studies have shown is that all consumers like a crisp, juicy apple, and so texture of that apple is what the thing we really focus on. And then whether it's a little tart, a little sweet, that's fine, we can deal with that. You know, when I first started this job, I don't know, almost 30 years ago, I, one of the things I did, I went out and visited a bunch of growers and uh, asked them, you know, what, what should I be trying to do in developing new fruit varieties? And I went and talked to an apple grower and um, one of the th things he told me was, you know, don't be thinking about just developing a, a better apple. You should really be thinking about developing an apple that competes against other different kind of foods. Because what we're competing against is, uh, you know, corn chips and candy and so forth for stomach space. You know, for example, in the case of Honeycrisp apple, I think that crispiness and that juiciness you know, along with a good flavor, are what really make an attractive option for a, for a, a person to eat, for perhaps a, a child to learn how to like fruit. It's really interesting some of the flavors we can come up with. I mean, we probably have kind of a concept of what an apple tastes like, but in certain lines we can find other kinds of flavors. We have, for example, anise flavors that come through in some lines. We have uh, cherry-like flavors, banana flavors. So. A lot of these, um, what we call secondary metabolites that, that we humans perceive as flavors, uh, are shared between different species of plants. And some of those that really characterize a different species are sometimes expressed in high levels in certain apples. Sometimes you find these things in the most amazing little packages. We've got a, a variety we named recently an apple called Frostbite. It's kind of an ugly, homely little apple but it's just got an amazing flavor. When we feed it to people, about half the people love it. About half the people say, I'm not even sure this is an apple or should be an apple, but it's got a, a kind of a tropical flavor. People who have eaten raw sugarcane will say this reminds them exactly of raw sugarcane. No matter what kind of position you might be in in plant breeding, you're gonna be communicating with people. And, and written communication is still really important. Working with groups of people, being a good team member is also really important. As far as other kinds of subject area you might study, um, there's certainly a quantitative part of plant breeding. So if you're like math and statistics, um, there's definitely a place to excel in plant breeding there. We also rely on, on some chemistry and uh, of course biology and genetics. 
In my job, the, one of the funnest things is to be going out through a field of seedlings in, in the orchard or in the vineyard and come across that one that just has a spectacular flavor on a fall day and you're outside in the sunshine. I mean, uh, what, a, what a great job to be paid to do. <laughs>